And, and I'm just gonna start by introducing our team. Um, my name is Kari Rabi. I'm a medical officer. I'm a family practice and addiction medicine physician here at NAC. And uh, Michelle, could you introduce yourself? Certainly. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Corcoran. I'm the nurse manager for the MAT program at NAC, and I help coordinate ECHO. Thank you. Tina? Hi, everyone. I'm Tina. I'm uh, the HIV case manager here at NAC and also help coordinate the ECHO. Um, and if you could just in the chat, if you're a guest today, just put your first and last name, credentials, the institution that you are affiliated with. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And Beth? Hi, my name is Beth Ryan, and I am an ECHO coordinator. Thank you. So if we could start the slides, please. Okay. Thank you. Next. Okay, so um, normally we do a prayer and land acknowledgement. Unfortunately, Renee was not, our elder in residence was unable to join us today. I'm, of course, going to do doing the introductions and agenda, Zoom guidelines. Michelle will be doing announcements. We're happy to have George Foley with us today, who's going to be doing our didactic presentation. And um, if we have time, uh, we're doing a case presentation, um, and then we will close. Um, so next slide, please. Um, we, it, it's, um, we're way into the pandemic, and I think we all know how to use Zoom. However, just so you know, um, as, as Tina said, please introduce yourself in the chat function, name, title, organization, and email. You can update your name and screen. You can right click on the image and rename it. Next slide. And then please, if possible, turn your camera so we can see you. I'm happy to see most people today have, yay. And then um, if we have any, please mute your microphone. And if you forget and you get to have a lot of noise in the background, we'll mute it for you. Please don't be offended. Um, and and you can use a chat or hand raise function for attention if you have a comment or a question. And then no protected health information, please. Um, Michelle, can you do the announcements? I sure can. Um, so we meet the first and third Wednesday of every month from noon to one. Um, feel free to join us and um, have some lunch, you know, drink your coffee, that sort of thing. Um, we know it's a lunch hour. Um, and if you are running a few minutes late, that sort of thing, totally fine. Um, upcoming sessions. Uh, so for September, not sure what the 29th is going to be yet. Um, we haven't had, we haven't confirmed it, but on the 15th for our next session, we're going to be talking about uh, borderline personality disorder, which is um, just a really, really good topic, um, something we should all strive to learn more about. Um, Dr. Kaz Nelson um, will be joining us for that. Next slide. Um, the, the ECHO is currently a partnership um, between NAC and Hennepin Healthcare. And uh, so we do want to let you know that they also have other ECHOs that may be of interest to you. So there's a viral hepatitis ECHO that's the first and third Tuesdays of the month. And then there's, they have an integrated opioid and addiction care ECHO. Um, that's every week on Thursdays. You're welcome to um, reach out to us at NAC or reach out to Beth Ryan, whose um, email address is on here. Or you can also go to the Hennepin Healthcare website and find a bunch of ECHO information there. Next slide. Case presentations. Someday somebody is going to send in a case presentation and I'm going to be so excited. Um, any, um, any things that you want to talk about related to, um, you know, chemical health, uh, behavioral health, anything like that, um, medical issues, concerns, any th great things you want to talk about, you can send to us and we'll talk about during the session. Um, yeah, it's just a great way for us to kind of learn from each other and kind of talk through um, what we've done and uh, maybe could do better or uh, that sort of thing with our patients. Next slide, Tina. And that's it. I'll turn it over to George. Yes, 
Okay. Can everybody see the presentation? Yes, thank you. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So, hi, I'm George Fraley. I'm a physician assistant and an HIV specialist. I've actually been working in HIV care since um, I was 18 years old, uh, but I've been an HIV provider uh, since 2008. I've mostly worked in Seattle, um, New Zealand, uh, New York City, and then now I am in St. Cloud, Minnesota, which is where I grew up. I'm here because my parents are getting a bit long in the tooth, and so I came to uh, hang out with them. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, inviting me today to have this chat. Uh, I was kind of invited a little bit last minute, which is totally cool. Um, but because of that, uh, I just wanted to explain the logo on this slide, which, which might be confusing, is because I'm going to be doing this presentation um, in the next couple of weeks for the Minnesota PA Academy. And so um, I already had this done, so this is why this looks that way. So my apologies if that's confusing. I also wanted people to know that there is a handout that um, probably got sent out with this presentation, which is like um, a user guide to what we'll be discussing today. So if there'll be a section where there's a slide where it's kind of hard to read the print, and I'll reference that you have that also on your handout, which will be probably easier for you to see. Um, and then I'm going to just kind of go through the presentation today and then address questions kind of at the end, just to make sure that we respect everyone's time. Um, so we'll get kind of started. So this topic is about what we do with a positive HIV test result. Currently, some people call starting um, medicine right away a rapid start or quick start. I like to call it immediate antiretroviral therapy or IART. So you'll uh, hear me referring it as IART. So I do have one disclosure, which is that this year um, I did participate in a Gilead um, Pharmaceutical Advanced Practice Provider Advisory Board, a one-time meeting about PrEP. But I, but I don't get ongoing financial contributions from Gilead Pharmaceuticals, just so to be clear. The objectives today are to be able to interpret HIV diagnostic labs, learn the importance of rapid initiation of HIV medications, and gain confidence in initiating HIV medications in a primary care setting. So HIV is often considered to be sort of a specialty medicine um, area, but the USPCTF, um, the standards of care, recommend that primary care providers, emergency rooms, um, basically anyone, uh, test people for HIV in the ages of 15 to 65. So while we oftentimes think of the care as specialty, we don't consider the testing specialty. We consider that primary care. So if we're ordering tests, we kind of need to know what to do with the tests when they come back, right? Especially when they come back positive. And then additionally, as, as all of you are very aware, we have these two outbreaks going on in Minneapolis and in Duluth. And um, so this is a little bit more urgent for Minnesota right now. Uh, and then high-risk groups should be screened every three to six months for HIV, and that includes men who have sex with multiple men, transgender women who have sex with multiple men, people who are sharing needles, and then people who engage in sex for work. Um, those folks should have a little bit more um, a frequent screening for HIV infection based off risk. Current state of HIV in Minnesota. In 2020, we saw 226 new cases reported. This is a decrease um, from the average of about 274. Uh, I would caution people from being too optimistic about this. We do know that the pandemic decreased access to HIV testing. So, and, and most people are a little bit nervous about like a rebound effect post pandemic. So we always think less cases is great news, but I just don't want people to get too, um, you know, overly encouraged by that decrease. We still see that um, people who are assigned male at birth account for the majority of HIV infections, about 84%. Men who have sex with men remain the highest risk factor. Um, two thirds of new HIV cases are amongst communities of color. And again, we have these two outbreaks going on um, in Minnesota, and that's just a hyperlink to those case counts. So how to screen for HIV? There's um, a couple different ways, but most people are using the fourth generation HIV test now. This is pretty much standard of care. This test is pretty accurate after 10 days. Um, after 14 days, it's a bit more accurate, but we generally use this test if someone's last risk was about 10 to 14 days ago. This is also the type of test that's done in most of the rapid tests is a fourth generation test. Um, when we order this test, it should automatically reflex to a confirmation should it come back positive. If you're doing blood work in the lab, of course, a rapid doesn't automatically reflex, but if you're doing it in the lab. 
And if you need to confirm a positive, um, we also need to get a NAT, or which, call, which is called an HIV RNA or a viral load. Uh, we can use viral loads if somebody's risk um, was about seven to 10 days ago, it can detect a really acute infection. So if I have somebody who comes in and they say, you know, a week ago, I had condomless receptive anal sex with somebody that I didn't know, um, I'm not going to get the fourth generation test because it's not going to catch that risk, but I might get a viral load, right? And then if we're using rapid tests, like out in the field or in a clinic, um, some people will take, uh, if the rapid test comes back positive, some people will say, okay, that's a positive. Personally, I like to confirm it with a second rapid. And if that second rapid comes back positive, um, then move forward as if this person was HIV positive. Um, and some people do that, some people don't, but I, I think it's, it's a bit more helpful. On the right here, this, this graphic, this is uh, new information from the CDC about how they recommend that HIV testing be done. So after a positive fourth generation, we move to the confirmatory to see if it's HIV one or HIV two. Um, if it's negative or indeterminate, but you've had these positives, you can get a viral load. And if the viral load comes back positive, it can sometimes mean that someone was in the acute phase of HIV, um, but is still HIV positive. So the bottom line there is if you have a positive viral load, that means that person did test positive. So why are we doing immediate antiretroviral therapy or IR? Well, we know that um, starting people on IR shortens the time between diagnosis and viral suppression. And we know that viral suppression reduces transmission to others. We know that it improves uh, retention and care. We also know that HIV untreated causes a generalized inflammation in the body, which can lead to poor health outcomes later in life, like heart attack and stroke and peripheral neuropathy, all of these things that, that um, can be quite severe for some people. We also know that when we start HIV medicine before someone's T cells get too low, their T cells will bounce back a bit higher. If we wait until someone's T cells are very, very low before we start treatment, they don't get as much of an immune response from that. So we wanna get people's immune systems back up and working as quickly as possible. And then of course, treating someone decreases their risk of, of acquiring AIDS-related illnesses like PCP pneumonia, because um, we're getting ahead of it. There have been two major studies looking at IART. And both of these studies found um, really good endpoints with uh, reductions in um, AIDS diagnoses, um, opportunistic infections like uh, PCP pneumonia, thrush, um, those types of illnesses. And we also saw, saw a really good increase in patients following up in care. So they were more retained in care, they went to more visits, they took their medicines better. There's a website down at the bottom that gets into those studies in more detail if you are interested in learning more about that. But um, the point of this slide is to just let you know that IART has been vigorously studied and um, works well with good health outcomes. Currently, all the major guidelines recommend IART as well. So um, the first guideline says that ART should be started as soon as possible after diagnosis, including immediately after diagnosis, unless the patient's not ready for that. And that um, if clinically appropriate, um, it, it improves linkage to care adequate, or sorry. So, so they're also saying though, if you're going to do it, that you need to have uh, good systems for linkage to care, adequate staffing, specialized services, um, and careful selection of medical therapy. And we'll talk more about that in detail in a minute. Uh, the World Health Organization set, defines IART as starting medication within seven days of diagnosis. I know in our healthcare system, getting if I were to refer someone to like infectious disease, getting them in in seven days is nearly impossible, right? So, um, so that can be a barrier, especially for our rural patients. And then the last guideline just says that ART should be started as soon as, as, soon as possible in all patients living with HIV, regardless of CD4 count. Um, and that also that starting IR should not be delayed for test results to come back. So basically, once you have the HIV test result, either the two rapids or the one positive fourth generation test, they're saying, get going, start treatment, wait for test results to come back later and deal with that once they're back in the house. So who should not be provided IR, right? Like who, who falls out of this program? So those who have been previously treated for HIV fall out of this program because we're worried about maybe some possible drug resistance. Those with known kidney failure shouldn't be involved. Um, and those who are confirmed pregnant, they can be offered IR, but it should be offered by somebody who takes care of pregnant people um, and HIV. 
those who appear medically or psychologically unstable, um, specifically signs of TB or cryptococcal meningitis, um, those folks we don't really want to be starting IR in. Um, so this includes headaches, nausea and vomiting, light sensitivity, and changes in mental status. If someone just has like a minor headache, that's different. If they have like the pounding headache, that's when we get worried. And then those under 18 years of age also should not be offered IR. If you need to find an HIV specialist, this link will take you to the database where you can find someone who's certified by the American Academy of HIV Medicine in your area. So HIV counseling, so somebody tests positive. Um, so now what do we do, right? And in Minnesota, we don't have any sort of signed consents for HIV testing anymore. It's an opt-out system. When I deliver a positive test result, just a couple tips that I do is that I try not to apply my own values about the diagnosis to the patient. So for example, I don't call someone and say, hey, John, I've got some bad news. Your test result came back positive. Instead, I, I just say, John, we got your test results back and your test result came back positive. So I'm not trying to shape how they deal with the um, acceptance of that news. I let them choose how they're going to emotionally address it, if it's bad news or not. I have had patients that I've told that they have HIV and it wasn't bad news for them. They were, they were like, okay, my partner's been positive and now we don't have to worry about it anymore. And that's kind of a weight off my shoulders, right? So I'm not making assumptions there. After I tell someone that they have HIV, I actually count to 10 seconds in my mind before I say anything else. Because I know that that patient's mind is just like going and going and going. And anything I say in that 10 seconds isn't going to be heard. And I'm kind of just doing it to fill space because I feel anxious. Um, so I try to personally just count for 10 seconds. Um, and then I ask them how they're doing before I get into all the medical counseling. I avoid the false hope of a false positive test. Um, patients always ask, you know, are you sure this is positive? Is there any way it can be a false positive? And I'll tell them there is a possibility, but, but it's very low. Um, but our blood test today will determine that. But we'd like to move forward like this is an accurate test result today. I often talk to patients about how this is a chronic condition now. It's one pill a day. There are a few side effects. There's a normal life expectancy. And that once you're undetectable, you won't transmit to anyone else. I often tell patients that HIV is now easier to control than diabetes with a lot fewer negative health outcomes than people have with diabetes. Now I say all that with the context that HIV stigma is still definitely a huge, huge issue. And I'm not trying to minimize stigma, but what I'm also trying to do is not play into the stigma by making HIV seem like a more complex medical condition than it needs to be if somebody's engaged in care. Um, and I always ask if I can connect someone to services, counseling, social work, treatment, um, et cetera. Additionally, if somebody is going to be started on IR that day, we need to talk about the basics, of course, of HIV. Like, what is a viral load? What is a CD4 count? How is this transmitted? How can I prevent transmission? The risks of not treating the HIV and the potential risks of starting the HIV medicine. So the, the major risk when we're talking about IR is a condition called immune reconstitution syndrome. This is extremely rare, and it's normally when somebody has a CD4 count less than 100. So and again, CD4 count means like T cells, they're immune cells. Uh, but you do want to create a plan should they feel worse once they start their medicine. So if that plan is if you feel worse, go to the ER. If it's call me, do a video visit, whatever it needs to be. But there should be some sort of follow-up plan in place before the patient leaves the office. We talk about side effects, and side effects are pretty rare now with our new medicines. Some people do get a little bit of stomach upset. Typically, if a patient takes their medicine with food or before bed, it can really reduce those symptoms. And that stomach upset typically goes away from most patients within one to two. Again, we talk about undetectable equals untransmittable, but we encourage condom use uh, until someone's undetectable or not sharing needles with anyone um, during that period of time, of course, as well. And then we talk about partner notification. Is there anyone else who should be tested? Uh, we talk about adherence, taking your medicine is vital to getting you to undetectable. And then we identify any barriers to adherence, whether that's housing, transportation, uh, mental health, substance use. Uh, and then we connect uh, patients with community organizations to help decrease those barriers. And that might not all happen on that first visit. You may do seven out of 10 of those or whatnot, um, but we make our effort to get as many of these done as possible. There are some visits when you tell someone that they have HIV, that it is only counseling and, and reassurance that can happen in that period of time. And, and that's okay too, it's patient by patient. 
could after this discussion, let's say that this patient decides that yes, they want to move forward with IR. Uh, this is something they want to do today. And I will say that the majority of my patients do want to move forward with IR. They feel like HIV, uh, if they can do something to take control of the infection, if they can do some sort of action step, they generally feel more comfortable with that. And so, um, so most patients I've found that do want to move forward with IR. So when somebody wants to move forward, we want to get some additional labs. So if we don't already have the HIV antigen antibody, because maybe they were tested in the field uh, with a rapid test, we'd want to grab one of those uh, because that will automatically reflex to the confirmatory. We want to get the HIV quantitative um, viral load, which is the viral load. And we want to get HIV genotyping or resistance testing. And we want to make sure that we're getting this one um, for both protease inhibitors and reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and then also integrase inhibitors, because uh, we're going to be using integrase inhibitor regimens. So we just want to make sure that we're getting those. We also want to get a baseline CD4 count or a T cell count. We want to check hepatitis A, B, and C. We want to get um, what's called a comprehensive metabolic panel looking at kidneys, liver, and electrolytes. We want to screen for any STIs that might be appropriate, which also includes uh, throat swabs and rectal swabs if anyone has performed oral sex on a penis or had receptive anal intercourse. And then, of course, syphilis, because syphilis is very easy to get. Uh, it's PG-13 sex, just skin-to-skin -skin contact, um, but can be quite serious if not caught. And in people with HIV infection, syphilis can progress much more quickly than people who don't have HIV infections. So we definitely want to check for syphilis. We want to get a urine analysis to check kidney function primarily, and then a pregnancy test for individuals of childbearing potential. So this is the screen I mentioned might be a little like ah, <laughs> on your screen, but it is in your handout. So um, please reference your handout if you have that available. So this is the, the regimens for IR. This is what's recommended. Um, there's three medicines here, or three, um, three types of medicines. Uh, and I'll just go through them really quickly for us. So the first one is Bictarvi, and this is probably the one that most people are familiar with. This is a single tablet taken once daily with or without food. Uh, it should not be used in people who have kidney function less than 30. Uh, less than 30 is pretty low. Um, typically people will know if they have kidney issues if it's that low. Um, but uh, anyway, we don't want to use it less than 30. Uh, anyone who's taking magnesium or aluminum containing antacids, uh, those can be taken two hours before or six hours after uh, their Bictarvi. There's also Tivacay and Descovy. Um, those are two pills taken together once a day with or without food. Again, um, not if they have creatinine clearance less than 30. Um, and then not with the magnesium or aluminum that's all in there. Now, the reason that this one's helpful is because this can be used in those that may become pregnant. Um, so again, we're not treating people who are pregnant, but if we have someone that we think might become pregnant, um, then this is the regimen to choose for that one. But again, it is two pills um, once a day. And then there's some Tuza. I would recommend some Tuza being your last choice uh, out of these. Uh, and I'm just going to, so, so the reason why is because some Tuza has a little boosting agent in it called Cobicystat. And Cobicystat um, can boost things we don't want it to boost. It can boost like Flonase, nasal spray for allergies. It can boost some people's cholesterol medicine. It can also boost some people's recreational substances. So um, I just think if we don't need to use a booster, let's not use it. Uh, but it is currently listed on guidelines as an approved option. So I just wanted to mention it. But I'd really focus on Bictarv and Tivacay plus the SCOVI as the options. Now, there's a little caveat I have here under Bictarv, which says that if a patient has recently been on PrEP, so they're taking PrEP to prevent HIV infection, but maybe they're like not taking it super great um, and they now have HIV infection. And if you're concerned at all that they may have developed any drug resistance to their PrEP, what you can do is you can start Bictagravir and Proscobix, which is a component of Simtuza. So that's two pills once a day. And that will definitely be strong enough to deal with any sort of um, transmitted or, or developed resistance to HIV. And then when we get the resistance testing back, uh, we could stop the Proscobix if there isn't resistance. And, and we'll talk about resistance, I think, in the next slide. Um, but if you're really concerned about resistance, uh, Bictarvi plus Proscobix is the way to go. Um, yeah. So once you've initiated the IR, um, if you don't plan on managing them long-term, right, you're going to be referring them to an HIV specialist or infectious disease or someone else, 
Um, you'll want to have them scheduled with that visit before they leave so that you know that's at least on the books. I typically recommend that that should be within seven days, but really it could technically be up to 30 days because the patient's going to have a 30 day prescription of their IR, so they'll have medicine for 30 days. But I think it's good to like link people quicker, especially if there's a missed visit or something, then they have more time to, to get in. Uh, I do encourage a check-in after 48 hours of starting IR, and that can be from nursing, patient navigator, case manager, social worker, whomever, uh, provider, uh, just to check in on side effects, see if there's any additional psychosocial support needed, and then just follow up on any questions they may have, because again, when somebody learns that they have HIV, they may not be, you know, absorbing all the information uh, that you were expounding on their visit. And then um, we plan for lab results. So lab results are going to start to trickle in. And you have to have a plan on how you're going to be getting the patient those test results, whether it's by phone, telemedicine, office visit, um, through messenger on your EMR, something, um, outreach worker. But we have to have some sort of plan in place to get the patient their test results. So when we're looking at these test results that are trickling in, right, these are some of the highlights we want to look for. So if somebody's CD4 count comes back less than 200, that means they have a pretty compromised immune system, and we want to protect them from things like PCP pneumonia. So we'll want to start either Bactrim double strength, one pill a day, or we can also do Bactrim single strength, one pill a day. It's my preference to start the single strength. I think it has less side effects than the double strength, but um, choose, choose your favorite. Um, both are totally fine. And then we can actually stop the Bactrim after someone's been undetectable for six months, regardless of CD4 count. If someone's CD4 count is less than 100, uh, then we really do want to consult with an HIV specialist. And maybe that we don't need to do anything different at all, but it's just like a good idea to, to reach out, get a little, you know, backup um, on deck. Now the viral load might be extremely high, right? The viral load might be like, 100 million, it might just be really, really high. That's okay. Um, these regimens that are for IART will get the person undetectable in most likely six weeks or less, regardless of how high the viral load. These integrase inhibitors are extremely potent. Um, they're really good drugs. So other labs that'll come back, we're gonna be looking at the EGFR and the kidney function, right? And remember that if that comes back less than 30, we wanna to refer to an HIV specialist because we're probably gonna to need to change the drug regimen. If the liver function tests are high, uh, but their hepatitis A, B, and C were all normal, then the, they could just be high because of the untreated HIV. And we would just wanna recheck that in a month and make sure it's trending down. Um, but oftentimes the liver enzymes can be high and, it, and it's just because the HIV is untreated. If platelets are really low, we also wanna recheck that in a month. There is um, a condition that with, a, with untreated HIV that can lead to low platelets. And the treatment for that condition is just HIV medicine. And we see those platelets start to come back up. Um, and then of course we wanna treat any positive STIs that we find. A little thing not on here, but, but we also don't wanna give any vaccines at this point. We only wanna give vaccinations once somebody is undetectable um, because they won't mount as good of an immune response to a vaccine when they're still fighting their HIV infection. So resistance testing, right? So this, I, I promise I won't get too in the weeds here, um, but this is what's called a genotype, this image. This is how they look when they are faxed in. This isn't what they look like when they come in through our electronic medical record system, but this is what they typically look like. And they use a stoplight approach, right? Red, yellow, green. Um, and so this is what we're, do we're doing because we wanna make sure that the person who came in who tested positive didn't contract an HIV that's already resistant to medicine. So somebody can transmit a virus that's already resistant to certain medicines, and we just want to confirm that our patient doesn't have those resistance patterns. So resistance to Bictagravir, Dolutagravir, and Darunavir are all extremely rare. And those are the medicines that were selected for IR because of that low barrier or that high barrier to resistance and the low amount of that resistance in the community. So that's why those regimens were chosen. If your genotype comes back showing a M184V mutation, um, it will say on this little chart that tenofovir or viriid um, is resistant. It'll have like a red or a yellow there. Um, I just bring this up because that's not actually a true resistance. Um, this is a weird one. What M184V does is it decreases one of the drug's effectiveness in Truvada and Descovy 
but it increases the effectiveness of tenofovir. So somebody with an M184 doesn't need to have their meds changed, even though it might look like it, because their tenofovir is going to be working harder for them. But if somebody does come back with a K65R, then that means that we can't use Truvada and Descovy, and we need to get them um, to an HIV specialist. Or you can add in that Priscobix, and that will cover this resistance pattern. If for some reason on a genotype you did see resistance to Bictagravir or Dolutagravir, then you would definitely want to stop the regimen and get them connected with an HIV specialist. But again, that would be pretty darn rare um, for that to occur. So after you know you've got you've talked to the patient about their test results, you've answered any additional questions, they tell you they're doing well on it, they aren't having too many side effects. Great. We'll see you back in 30 days for your next follow up. At that 30 day follow up, we're going to get a viral load test, a complete metabolic panel, and we're going to assess adherence and any barriers that may exist. We're not going to grab a CD4 count at that time. It will not have changed very much over that period of time. And CD4 counts tend to like kind of stress patients out. So we're going to just like let that be. Once undetectable, um, we'll then start following the patient every three months for the first year. If I see someone at 30 days and they're not undetectable yet, I will see them back in another month to confirm their undetectable status. But once they're undetectable, I just see them every three months. At those three month visits, I'm getting a viral load, CD4 count, and then a complete metabolic panel, doing STI screening as appropriate. And I try to prescribe 90 days worth of medicine, um, depending on the, the patient's housing situation, their access to storing pills. But I think the less times that the patient has to interact with a pharmacy, kind of the better, especially if they live in a small town and like know the pharmacy and all the staff. Um, I try to do 90 day or organize a mail order uh, pharmacy for them. Once undetectable for a year, then we can move to just every six monthly follow ups. And again, if not undetectable, I follow monthly until they are and assess barriers to adherence. Um, these are some of the wraparound services that we're using. I know that some of you have your own wraparound services, um, but we use Rainbow Health and RAN a lot for case management services and to help with insurance navigation, housing, social work, that kind of stuff. Um, and in rural, well, in St. Cloud, which isn't super, super rural, but um, RAN has been really helpful for us in this region. So if you don't have access to an HIV specialist, uh, I'm always happy to help. So um, my phone, our phone number for our clinic is there and I'm always happy to see patients. I do a lot of HIV management over telemedicine now. Um, I just did one this morning. The patient was making a beautiful gown and talking to me about their HIV. I'm happy to see a patient where, however I can. Um, and patients can also schedule online um, through our website. If you wanna become an HIV specialist and um, that can also be an HIV pharmacy specialist, um, you can go to the American Academy of HIV Medicine, and there's also this national HIV curriculum from my alma mater, uh, the University of Washington, which is really thorough and amazing and online. Now, this is the handout that you should have received over email. This is an IART protocol guide that I made. So basically, this is the talk we gave today, but in a two-page, like, handy-dandy, um, take-with-you kind of situation. Uh, and so hopefully you find that, that helpful. Um, please feel free to share that with anyone you want if you think they might also find it helpful. And that's the, the chat, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen now. Thank you so much, George. Um, I found that that was very comprehensive and I think that the resources are going to be great. Anybody have any questions or things that have come up for them that they want to ask, George? I was curious, um, Michelle and I were both curious about uh, what you do when you confront a patient who doesn't have insurance. So th those patients aren't, aren't always one in the same, right? As you're very well aware, I'm sure. So I'll give you an example of, of one. Um, and maybe this could count as the case presentation, but um, we had a patient who was diagnosed um, in our emergency room and the emergency room physician knew me. So they called us and they had the patient come right over to see me in clinic, right? I just double booked, whatever. And then um, the patient did not have insurance. I called RAN 
ran, got on the phone with the patient, took down the information they needed, filed their Medicaid um, ADAP all right then. I talked to our pharmacy and they were willing to dispense 30 days of Bictarvi under this category of Medicare or Medicaid pending. So they gave the patient the medicine. I ordered all the tests because I had confirmation from RAN that this application had been submitted. Um, and then that worked great. The patient left without paying anything for it. Medicaid went into effect the next day. Uh, the insurance was able to, or the pharmacy was able to back bill for the medicine. And then all of our labs were covered under the Medicaid as well. So the patient is now undetectable um, after one month uh, and continues to move forward now with ADAP. Uh, so that's how we have worked it here in our system is kind of this like rapid connection with RAN and patient navigation and insurance navigation. And it's your own pharmacy, it's your own systems pharmacy, is that correct? Yes, it is, um, it is. And so I know that there's like the Walgreens specialty in Minneapolis that might be easier to navigate with um, we don't have really like an HIV specialty pharmacy in our area. Um, and so, you know, I've built that relationship with that pharmacy to kind of trust that we know what we're doing. <laughs> but the Walgreens in Uptown, I think, you know, they know their game, so. Yeah, and and we we use them for hepatitis C meds, but we, I don't I don't know how much we've done the, but maybe we could loop, loop them in on that. And then there are some clinics who do um, IART starter packs. So when I was working in New York, uh, the way that would work is a patient would leave the clinic with seven pills of Bictarvi um, and they would come back in one week and then we would have all that insurance stuff done in one week, right? Um, we don't have access to that here and that's because like the pharmacy would have to break a bottle of Bictarvi, which means they still have to pay for it, right? And so they're like, nah, you're either taking the bottle or you're not. Because he's like, what are we going to do with these other pills just sitting here in our office? We can't give it to anybody. Um, so, so we've just worked out that we're always giving 30 days. But some places do do a starter pack. And I think I think there may even be samples of Bictarvi. We, we actually do have samples. Yeah. So if we had samples, I would probably start IART with sample packs while we're waiting for insurance confirmation. Um, but we just don't, they don't allow me to have samples here. Yeah, they and also we had we had I for for post exposure prophylaxis. I understand that Bictarvi might be being used, being approved for. Yes, super controversial topic. Um, I agree, Bictarvi is probably absolutely fine for PEP. Um, study is ongoing. Um, one of the issues is that Truvada is approved for PEP, but Descovi isn't, and so that's where people get all kind of crunched about. Um, but really it should be the same mechanisms of action and it should be totally appropriate to use the Yeah, mm -hmm. but studies are out, yeah. Thank you. George, could you describe a little bit about your team, like how your process works for the, the nuts and bolts before they arrive to you? Yeah, yeah, so um, it can depend on um, where patients are coming from. So uh, if they're coming from like an HIV rapid test event, then they will um, go onto our website actually and schedule an appointment with me so that they're in our, our electronic system, in which case then I can write test orders and everything right from the computer and prescribe right from the computer and it's all in there and um, the patient can be connected with our patient navigator, whose name is Katie. And Katie can also schedule appointments, um, fax lab orders to various labs who may need them, um, coordinate with getting a prescription to a pharmacy that might work better for a patient than, than what we know, um, whatever works best for the patient, right? Um, and then Katie, is now also like kind of tracking our patients who are HIV positive to make sure that those who aren't undetectable, um, she's, she's chatting with them about like what barriers to care exist for them and then linking them with different social services to try to decrease those barriers to care and then scheduling them with me um, or Dr. Mott, whoever they prefer. And we are offering patients now always either in person or video visits 
um, and patients kind of like flip flop with that. Like one time they'll do video and the next time they'll do in person and, and whatever works works, but we're just trying to become as low barrier uh, to, to us as possible. HIV medicine, a lot of it is really lab based. It's really about what's your viral load, what's your CD4. Um, there's not a huge ton of physical exam that goes into it unless a patient is sick. But if a patient's not actively sick, it's mostly labs. And so Katie does the vast majority of that kind of linkage to lab and then to me. So, you, so obviously you have like a preset sort of template and everything like you said. Um, we, we don't necessarily have a, pre, a preset. You mean like in terms of lab orders? Well, just in history and everything like that. Yeah, we, we do. We, we've done some, um, Katie's gone through like motivational interviewing training. And then we have um, done some additional trainings about like what are the topics of barriers to care. Um, and so Katie ha does have like a list of topics to like hit on, but we don't have like a formal sort of like checkbox situation. Um, just because uh, most patients are just so different. You know, th there are certain topics we wanna hit, but their answers are so widely variable. Um, but yeah, we do have a topic list. Thank you. Um, when you said that, I, I might have missed a little piece of this. When you said that you're concerned about, if you're concerned about um, resistance for for um, because somebody's been on prep, that's because you'd be concerned they've been non-adherent or they yeah, have. So yeah, so just to kind of dive into that one quick moment, because I can't help myself. So if somebody acquires HIV while they're on PrEP, that means they weren't adherent, right? Because we know that PrEP is like 99% effective, right? So that means that they were taking less than four pills a week, probably one to two a week. Um, with that, they may develop resistance to Truvada or Descovy. And Bictagravir um, or Bictarvi has Bictigravir and then Truvada and Descovy in it. So if you're giving them the same medicine they were using for PrEP and they have adherence to it, I mean, uh, they were having it, resistance to it, you might be giving them a regimen that's not fully active. But what we know is that the M1ED4 mutation is really common uh, for people on PrEP who are missing a lot of doses in seroconvert. That, that's not uncommon. But we know that that doesn't knock it out because it's just making the, the Truvada work better. But if somebody has that K65R, that means they got HIV and they probably have been taking their PrEP like with that for a couple months or more, you know, and maybe missed their last PrEP follow-up. And so they haven't had an HIV test in a while. And then they might develop that resistance. And if they have the K65R, then the Truvada and the Discovy just aren't going to be effective. And so then they're only on really Bictagravir. Not, they're not even on Bictarvi anymore. Right? They're just on Bictagravir, the integrase component. Now, integrase inhibitors are strong, and some people might get undetectable with just Bictagravir alone. But we want to add another agent in there to just build a more robust system. So if they had a K65, I would do, like, I, I would if I had a choice, and it wasn't IR where I'm just guessing, right? I have all this data in front of me. Then I would prescribe them Tivok and Proscobex. So two pills once a day. Those two drugs have huge barriers to resistance. They're really well tolerated um, and they're going to get undetectable on that. But yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then just a caveat, like if, if you know, you're doing the testing and somebody comes back also positive for hepatitis C, right? So, okay, now you've got HIV and hep C. You want to control the HIV before curing the hep C typically. Um, we just see a little bit of better cure rates if somebody's undetectable before we start hep C cure as well. Um, and we're doing hep C cure now all sorts of ways, like in-person telephone video, we're, we're doing it all sorts of ways. Um, and it seems to be working well in general um, across all different modalities. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't sound like something that you really need to refer to specialty for necessarily. It's like it's relatively straightforward just as a matter of staging it. Yep, I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, like five years ago, I would not have this conversation about IR with like anyone. I'd be like, oh my gosh, no, send me your HIV patients immediately. But with the advent of Bictagravir, with Bictarvi, it's just like, it's one pill a day. People really tolerate it. Um, 
you're really unlikely to have a transmitted resistance to it. And then with HIV, it's all about the viral load. So once somebody's undetectable, their CD4 count fluctuations and stuff, those don't even matter because CD4 counts very wildly. They, you might be in a bad mood, you'll have a terrible CD4 count. It doesn't matter. As long as you're undetectable, you're good, you're gold. So really, you know, as long as somebody has no opportunistic infections, um, as long as they're on Bactagravir or taking it, they're gonna do great. So it's just a different world now um, in terms of our treatments. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you, science. Right. Yeah. Yes, right. The same as MFC treatment. But yay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Maverick and Oclusa really changed the game there too with their pangenotypic um, treatments. Um, I just really wish that it was a little bit easier to get them through the insurance industry. Um, but yeah, one day. Always. And then um, if if you have a patient who's like like we we have a couple patients who really don't are not very. Um, adherent to their regimen. And, and so if you're waiting, so one of our patients has is not undetectable. Um, as far as vaccines go, would you, would you go ahead and vaccinate them because we don't know when they will become undetectable? I would, yeah. And then um, once, you know, life changes for them and maybe they're a bit more stable, then I'd run <laughs> antibodies to different things to see if they did. And if they didn't develop antibodies, I'd revaccinate. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if somebody just really struggles with adherence, we, we then give the vaccine. We wouldn't give um, a live vaccine, but um, any other ones, yeah. yeah. And I, I, as you can see, I'm taking advantage of having you here today to ask a lot of questions. That's okay. Uh, I love it. <laughs> um, so, so the guidelines for the extra COVID um, shot uh, for people who are HIV positive is intended for people who are um, have a who are not controlled or who who have AIDS. I'm hearing that all it's pretty much HIV providers are recommending it for all HIV patients. Is is that kind of what you guys are doing? We don't have booster approval yet here in our system, um, but. Yeah, we'll probably end up offering, I mean, eventually all of us are going to get a booster, right? And so um, we're, if we can take advantage of getting our HIV patients boosted quicker, then, mm -hmm. then we will. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, if we're prioritizing, we're going to be prioritizing people who are not undetectable um, or who have a low CD4 count, meaning below probably 200 or 500. We haven't made a hard pass rule. What I'm hearing in the city is that is that from patients who are who, who are seeing specialty HIV providers is that they're getting their boosters. Yeah, um, that's fair. Uh, I I think they're kind of taking advantage of the loophole. I, I don't think it's medically necessary, um, but we do what we can do, right? So. Um, People with HIV get to move to the front of the line sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> this gets to be one of those times, I think. That's, that's okay. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, one other little caveat before that folks go is just um, when we start IR, sometimes people are like, well, wait, you're talking about kidney function. You're talking about resistance. You're talking about these things. What happens if like this person does come back and their kidneys are in the toilet and I started this medicine, like, have I just ruined them? You know, and the answer is no, you're gonna have your test results back in like a week. And so if somebody does have, have low kidney function, you'll stop the medication and, and then their kidneys will either stay healthy or go back to healthy. Uh, the kidney function stuff with these meds really take place over a prolonged exposure. And same with like the resistance, if they were resistant to the components of Bictar, Bictarvi, um, but you caught it early enough, you're not going to develop resistance to the Bictagravir. Um, so it's all just about making sure you have that linkage to communication about the lab results on the back end. Um, and only giving 30 days with the first script, because you don't want somebody having three months of medicine walking around before you have the test results come back. Yeah, absolutely. So any last questions? Um, Tina, remind me of our, our topic next week is on um, borderline personality disorder with Dr. Kaz Nelson. Um, but so any other last questions before we wrap it up? Any um, comments, George, any, any other little tidbits? I just want to say thank you for having me. 